Okay, so we're now streaming live. Uh, welcome everyone to the media briefing. It's Friday, June 19th. Today we will hear from Acting Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Julie Emily. We'll also hear from Chair Karen Redman, followed by CAO Mike Murray. So to kick things off, we'll hear from Dr. Julie Emily. Go ahead, Julie. Thanks, Julie. So as we have seen over the past month, the number of new cases that we are reporting continues to remain relatively low. While our numbers are moving in the right direction and we continue to move past the peak, we must remain vigilant and remember that the virus is still active in Waterloo Region. There has been much comment on the subject of masks over the past week, and this is a good thing because it shows that we continue to be deeply invested in keeping our community safe. As we know, there are many different ways to keep our community safe. Practicing physical distancing in the appropriate setting, washing our hands often and not touching our face, staying at home and isolating from others if we have symptoms, getting tested when we are sick. And wearing masks plays a key role in keeping our community safe. Public health strongly recommends masks in all indoor settings and on transit this is part of a comprehensive approach that includes the other me measures that I have mentioned. Today, we are launching a social media campaign to reinforce the importance of wearing masks and to make wearing of masks the new normal. Chair Redman will provide you with more details about the Face Mask Friday campaign. Public health is also working with local business owners and we want to hear from businesses about how we can help increase the wearing of masks in situations where physical distancing cannot be maintained. This is a complex subject and there is no simple answer. As always, we truly appreciate the comments and feedback that we have received this past week. We understand your concerns and will continue to evaluate the situation in our region. We continue to have collective responsibility to do what we can to minimize the spread of COVID-19 in Waterloo Region. We will share this responsibility for some time to come, but by making the right decisions, we will protect the health of our friends and family, and we will help ensure that our economy can contribute to the reopening. Public health measures are certainly becoming part of the new normal, and we appreciate what our community has done to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Let's continue to work together. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. We'll now hear from Chair Redman. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Julie. Now that Waterloo Region has fully entered into stage two, we're getting a better idea of what the next reality looks like. Physical distancing, good hand hygiene, and wearing a mask has not changed. And in fact, it's more important now than ever. I want to bring your attention to some of the initiatives that the region is working on to further promote public health measures and keep them top of mind for everyone. Staff are actively collaborating with the Economic Development, Public Health, and GRT to further spread the word about the important public health measures and especially about mask wearing. We're connecting with local businesses to understand from their perspective the wearing of masks in their establishments, possible barriers, and how we can support them. I'm participating along with others in a virtual public consultation town hall hosted by the region with local businesses and Dr. Wong on Thursday, June the 25th, 2020 from 1130, sorry, from 1030 to 1130 AM. In an effort to normalize mask wearing as part of our everyday new reality, today public health is launching a hashtag face mask Friday campaign. We encourage everyone who is out in the community to share a photo wearing their face mask. All you have to do is take a photo of yourself wearing a mask, post it up your picture on Twitter with the hashtag Face Mask Friday. And don't forget to tag Waterloo Region Public Health so we can see all your lovely faces. Public Health encourages all of us who can wear a mask to do so. But let's also remember to be kind and sensitive to those who cannot wear a mask for a variety of reasons. Let's protect each other by wearing a mask where possible. This week, Grand River Transit launched a new campaign, Let's Protect Each Other, to remind riders of their collective responsibility to do just that, to protect each other. The campaign highlights 
of the safety measures GRT is taking, such as more frequent cleanings, the application of antimicrobial solution on vehicles and barriers between operators and customers. It also highlights how riders can help by wearing a mask covering while riding, spreading out from others as much as possible, and paying a fare with a fare card rather than cash. For more information, it can be found at www.grt.ca slash ride safe. I hope all of us will continue to embrace the role of protecting one another so that transit remains a safe ride for everyone. This Sunday, June 25th is National Indigenous Peoples Day, a day for all Canadians to recognize the unique heritage, diverse cultures and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. It's also a day for people to reflect on the current struggles that Indigenous people face and what actions they can take to help create positive change within their community. First Nations, Inuit and Métis people each have their own distinct heritage language, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs, all of which should be respected and honored. In Waterloo Region, we have made a commitment to reconciliation with local Indigenous communities. It is important for us to acknowledge and learn about the history of the land and pay respect to the Indigenous people that did and do continue to live here. The region of Waterloo is situated on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and neutral people. We acknowledge the enduring presence and traditional knowledge and philosophies of Indigenous people with whom we share this land. This year, the date also follows on, falls on the, both the summer solstice and solar eclipse, a special time of prayer and spiritual connectedness for many. Last year, our community gathered across Waterloo Region to celebrate Indigenous culture, including at the universities, Waterloo Public Square, and Kitchener's Farm and Market. This year, our celebrations will be different due to COVID-19. Some of the local virtual events include Indigenous initiatives at, Water at Wilfrid Laurier University in partnership with the Center for Student Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and the Center for International Governance and Innovation are hosting a virtual fireside teaching with Kathy Absalon, an Anish Braubeg storyteller and knowledge carrier. The Woodland Cultural Center will be hosting on a free online screening of the documentary, Six Miles Deep, and a discussion with director, Sarah Rock. This Sunday marks ION's first year of service. It's incredible to think that this year has gone so quickly. For thousands who attended the launch day, the hundreds of volunteers who helped orchestrate it, and the millions of riders who have traveled during the first few months to the challenging times that we have been faced with, providing essential and critical workers with transportation so they can continue to serve our community. Looking to the future, as the region continues to reopen and more people return to transit, ION will be there for them, and this service will continue to support and shape our region for decades to come. We would have liked to celebrate this important milestone in person, but of course we can't. You may have already been to the special anniversary video. It's been uploaded today on our social media channels. It can be viewed at www.grt.ca. Happy anniversary, ION. This weekend is also Father's Day a day we will honor our fathers and the father figures in our lives. While visiting within your bubbles or having physically distant visits, may you enjoy this time of celebrating and happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Thanks, Karen. Okay, we'll turn it over to Mike for a quick update on enforcement. Thanks, Mike. Yep, <clears throat> so this will be brief, uh, our brief Friday enforcement update. So, our enforcement partners continue to be active. So that would be Water Region Police, um, Regional Bylaw, Public Health Inspectors, and Local Municipal Bylaw. So this past week, over the week, um, they, uh, they did 206 uh, site visits that involved either warnings or education. They did 245 site visits where no action was required. 
as always, be, either because uh, they got there and um, there was no violations or uh, people were, um, were being appropriate. Um, and there was one new charge laid over this past week um, that was laid in Kitchener by Kitchener bylaw um, for um, uh, uh, people using uh, recreational amenities on a school property um, in contravention of the emergency order. So in total, uh, 452 um, points of contact between our, um, our enforcement staff and the public and one new charge laid, which uh, if you're doing the math, brings the total number of charges to date to 21. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to all of our presenters. We'll now turn it over to you for questions. And we'll start with Joanna from the record. Go ahead, Joanna. Thank you. Um, this question is probably for Julie. Um, just wondering about the new long-term care outbreaks. There's two new uh, after several days of just having the one at Forest Heights. Is that concerning for you guys or expected? Well, I, I think it's, it's expected given that um, we're undergoing more screening again in long-term care homes through enhanced surveillance. And we do know that there is COVID-19 still in our community. We have learned a lot from the outbreaks that we've had to date and we've worked very closely with long-term care homes and you've probably noticed over the course of the last several months our outbreaks um, are tend to be less and they tend to end quicker and I think it's because the long-term care homes now um, have a good understanding of what they have to put in place to keep residents safe and we've worked with them closely to identify how to support them with their IPAC measures and handling outbreaks when they do occur. So this is not un unexpected. All right. Um, and just wondering, have you identified any more cases related to the uh, Kitchener rally? Dr. Wong had said um, earlier in the week that there was one. So we've had no, you're talking about the Black Lives Matter rally? Yeah. Yes, so um, there's been no other cases and we're now past the two week mark. And so as we know, for um, COVID, we expect if you're going to get COVID from a specific exposure, it'll occur within 14 days of that exposure. So we're now past that 14 day mark. All right. And there's been a lot of talk today about masks um, and discussion in the community. And I guess sort of what are your feelings on masks i know they're still not mandatory here but we're hearing a lot of calls from the public saying that they should be mandatory i think we're having across the country not just in waterloo discussions occurring about the role of masks in decreasing transmission to covid 19. Um, as dr wong has said um, we strongly recommend that you use non-medical masks when you're out and about in the community and you're not able to physically distance because we know the foundation of preventing transmission of COVID-19 between individuals is physical distancing and hygiene, staying at home when you're sick. And masks are an additional tool in circumstances where you can't maintain uh, physical distancing. And so when you're hearing, um, I think through uh, both what I said and what Chair Redmond said and what Dr. Wong has said in the past, we are strongly recommending this. And we want to change the social norms in our community so that this becomes the new normal. And so, you know, launching the social media campaign is one aspect of that because helping people understand and be aware of this and, and generating a dialogue in our community so that it does become the new norm. So I guess you're happy, as you said, you're happy that people are talking about this because it shows yes. people are, are very passionate about it. What, one way or the other. Yes, and, and I think anytime um, a discussion happens in any community setting where there's varying views, you hear different perspectives and it, it increases the richness of discussion. And so I think you appreciate from what Chair Redmond said and I said, is we are engaging people in that discussion and we're engaging the business community about how can we support them to make this the new normal. All right, did uh, Mike or Karen want to add to that? I, I would just add um, that uh, 
you know, throughout the whole pandemic, um, we've followed the guidance and direction from federal and provincial experts. And we continue to do that. So when you look at, you know, what guidance direction the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario have provided, um, they're all delivering this, the same message, which is very consistent with uh, Region of Waterloo Public Health's message. And that is um, that people should, um, are strongly recommended to wear a mask in public places when physical distancing is not possible. So, so that continues to be the federal and provincial guidance. And we continue to follow that federal and provincial guidance. And we continue to monitor um, the evolving um, you know, state of knowledge about this. Uh, and you know, uh, I think one of the things we've learned through the whole pandemic is um, things evolve, information evolves, guidance and direction evolves. And so you know, we're continuing to monitor that and engage in those discussions, but continuing to follow pretty clear federal and provincial guidance at this point in time. All right, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. We'll move on to Kate from CBC. Go ahead, Kate. This is a terrible idea. I can't see anything on my screen. <laughs> um, my, my first question um, is to Dr. Emily. On Tuesday during a regional council committee meeting, um, one of the councillors, uh, Mayor Sue Foxton from North Dumfries said that people are sort of getting a false sense of security from our good numbers. So when they go to a store and maybe the store owner is saying to them, I'd like you to wear a mask, they're saying, no, the region doesn't require it. We don't need to look at our numbers, we're fine. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can respond to that and whether, whether there needs to be maybe a rewording of how we're addressing this. Thanks, Kate. So I, I think that addresses some of the challenges with when we're in a good situation, because we are, our numbers are down, but we have to stress the reason our numbers are down is because of the, all, all the hard work we as a community have done. And to keep numbers down, it's just not one thing. It's the action we do in public health to get people who are positive and follow them up quickly and follow their contacts up quickly. It's the testing push that's out in the community to identify people as quickly as possible. It's all the public health measures that we've been stressing over the past several months. And I think, you know, some of the consistent messaging from Dr. Wong has been, we still have to be vigilant. We, the actions we take today determine where we are next week and the week after. And so it's that balancing messaging. We wanna reassure people that we are in a good situation and that's why we have reopened. But at the same time, if we want to stay in that situation, we have to continue the measures that we have recommended. And so that's the balancing of messaging um, that we have to continue to do. And I guess I'll, I'll ask you and I'll ask um, maybe Chair Redman and Mike as well. Um, you know, we heard on Tuesday, Chair Redman, you talked about an experience of, of young people kind of getting yelled at at a store for for not wearing mask, uh, for asking people to wear masks. Um, Mayor Foxton mentioned, you know, she went to Home Depot and she was one of three out of 70 people wearing a mask. When I've talked to people in Guelph where it's mandatory, the store owners say, you know what, at least I know that I have to have a sign up on my door and I do my best to make people wear a mask. Like it's almost like a security thing for them. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, you know, as Sue Foxton said, you know, some businesses feel like they're being failed by the community in this situation. And, and there was a push by some councillors to make masks mandatory. So why not just make it mandatory for now and do what Wellington Dufferin Guelph is doing, which is if you have to do your best to make sure people wear masks and, you know, the, the penalization comes if the business doesn't even try. So I, I'm, I'm going to jump in and then I'll ask Dr. Emily and Mike maybe too. I, I think that one of the reasons why Waterloo Region has been able to go to phase two is the fact there has been so much community uh, uptake and compliance. We have always come at the guidance from the province uh, as something that uh, started with education and moved to compliance. So we haven't been heavy handed in handing out tickets. There are large 
um, enterprises where they have somebody stationed at the door, they hand them sand, hand, hand sanitizer, they say you have to wear a mask and they monitor them or they count how many people go in and you know, you can think of any of the big box stores or the big grocery stores. There are so many small and medium sized businesses that are so eager to get back to um, making a living, they are being compliant. And it has always been our first line of involvement with businesses and, and what we will continue to do is to work with small and medium sized businesses to work with that portion of the community to say, how can we do this better? The, um, you're quite right, Kate, that, that I, it was a farm gate store and this um, owner was very upset that people were being very rude to young um, employees. I always think of the one person operator of a convenience store and how are they going to um, enforce this and there's two sides to the coin one is compliance and the other is to be a bit of a vigilante. So we're really hoping that we can appeal to the community minded part of everybody's nature to say you need to do this. There's nothing right now from stopping stores putting up a sign that says masks um, need to be worn. It doesn't have to be um, have that stick at the end. Uh, we, it worries me personally as somebody who represents the entire community to worry about the possibility of a lack of enforcement charge ending up with a $5,000 fine. And I guess the other observation I would make is that of course that um, public health monitors um, what the experts are saying, what's happening across Ontario. Um, as CAO Mike Murray does that, uh, I haven't seen any other regions jump forward and make mask wearing mandatory, but of course we're monitoring what's happening in other communities, but we're really hoping that moving forward with education and cooperation will continue to be a compelling approach to getting people to wear masks and um, physically distance and wear masks when they can't. Did anyone else want to jump in or? Okay, I great. don't have anything to add, thank you. Kate, do you have any other questions? Uh, just one more. Um, I know that public health is canvassing businesses, but if businesses aren't hearing from public health and they want to say something, how do they get in touch? What do they do? Is there a forum online? Is there anything that they can do? Do you want me to jump in from a communication standpoint? So um, I believe that they can, um, they, they could probably easiest to email public health at region of waterloo.ca and we'll get them to the right people. Okay, I'm done, <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks Kate. We'll move on to Tim from 570. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, this question's for Chair Redmond or uh, Mike Murray. Uh, with uh, Father's Day this weekend, how will enforcement look? Is it just going to be the, the same as what you're doing? Or do you have any extra measures in put in place just in case people gather with uh, extra people? Um, so uh, so the, the short answer is we'll have the same enforcement activity that we've had for a while. I was going to be a little bit facetious and say, you know, fathers, me being one, you know, we're highly compliant. Um, so I'm sure that uh, all fathers will, you know, comply with all the emergency orders and will ensure that all of their family who are celebrating with them also comply with emergency orders just because, you know, we're compliant folks, us dads. So, sounds good. And then with Face Mask Friday, that campaign, how was that process in order to launch it? How, how did that go for the, for the region? Um, I can speak to that again from communications. We, we actually came up with it as an idea in public health before the, the discussions started happening this past week. Um, and then we started to share it more broadly, um, conversation with Chair Redmond, and we saw it as an opportunity to really, you know, group together and try to, to get the word out. And I know our regional counselors were very interested in um, being able to help further that messaging. So it really just started as we have been all through the pandemic as public health wanting to communicate the most recent uh, measures and, and advice. And it kind of grew from there. 
Now, um, with with like with talk with with businesses, would that be something that you would be able to promote within businesses that are trying to make sure that um, masks are being worn within their, like just say a sign or anything with the hashtag on it in front of the business? Is that something that is being discussed? Um, this is a big day for me. Uh, I I know that we're looking at similar to. We want to talk to businesses first, Tim, to make sure that we understand what they need in terms of support. Um, and I know our economic development department is actually helping us lead that and liaise with the business community. Um, with that said, I think we're looking at a similar process that we follow for um, our check it, we inspect it uh, protocols. So we have stickers that we provide to um, businesses that we inspect and um, they can put those in their windows. So I, I think that'll be something we will float out there as an option. Um, but it, at this point, a decision hasn't been made because we really want to engage the business community. That's great. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, we'll move on to Namish from uh, Waterloo Chronicle. Go ahead, Namish. Um, just, just a clarification, a question for Dr. Emily on the, on the Black Lives Matter rally. Now that there appears to have only been um, one person that did, did contract it, do you still expect there to be more from there? Or is it now that the two-week period is over, do you expect um, that sort of to be done with now? Yeah, so after the two-week period ends, we would expect any cases that came from that would have already presented themselves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't guarantee that someone with symptoms doesn't come to us till later, yeah. right? But in general, if someone were to have got it at that rally, they should have had symptoms by this point. Um, do you think that um, the persistent use of masks at that rally really helped in the fact that it, it was outdoors and then um, prevented people from spreading or? Okay, um, so I think that was key. Like, and I think it's a very good example of we ask the community to act responsibly. And so if you saw a lot of the photos of that day, people were wearing masks and they were trying to be physically distanced. And so they respected the advice we provided and as a collective group, decreased the risk of transmission amongst them. So I think it was a key contributor to the fact that we're not seeing cases. Right. And this question's for Mike Murray. Um, just going to ask about enforcement. Um, now that the restrictions are sort of being lifted slowly, um, I was wondering if enforcement is going to be staying the same or is, um, or is there going to be reduced enforcement over the next few weeks since the restrictions aren't as big as they were before? No, I, I think enforcement will continue, um, you know, in a similar way to what's happened over the last, you know, few weeks and months. Um, there's, you know, still need for compliance. There's still need for monitoring. Um, in, in some cases, it's actually even more important as things open up to make sure that, um, you know, things are opening up in an appropriate way, consistent with the emergency orders, consistent with guidance from um, the province. So, yep, enforcement will, monitoring and enforcement will continue um, as it has been. Um, and just just one last question with um, daycare centers and uh, child care centers opening up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I know that there's going to be some screening at the front door of these um, uh, establishments. So I was wondering who like who has to be hired for, for these types of roles? Does it have to be a doctor or a nurse or is it someone that works at the, the child care center? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so my understanding. So it's a really good question. Then. And, um, you know, opening up child care centers is subject to a really long list of health and safety requirements to keep the staff safe, the children safe, and you know, families, visitors, to keep everybody safe. Um, I, th I think the idea is to provide appropriate training for all the staff on all the guidelines that are in place, and then the staff take on the responsibility for administering all the protocols that are in place around screening, uh, I mean, they have to screen children, visitors, family, um, you know, every day. So uh, it won't be a doctor or nurse. It will be the staff in the, the child care centers who will be trained uh, to follow the guidelines. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thanks, Amish. We'll move on to Irene from Air News. Go ahead, Irene. Hi. Um, I think my question is for Mike Murray. Mike, going back to the one charge in Kitchener at the, on the school property, do you know how much uh, the person was fined?
um, I believe all of the all of the charges that have been laid carry the same fine, uh, and it's a seven hundred and fifty dollar fine. Okay, and in this case, uh, who would be fined? Was it like was it a group of people or just one person? Do you know? Uh, uh, I don't have a lot of detail, but I believe it was an individual. I mean, oh, okay. It's always an individual. The charge has to be laid on an individual. And so uh, I imagine in this case, it was an individual who was, um, you know, not obeying the emergency order about um, using the amenities in a, in a playground. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just wondered if it was a group, how would they know who to find, but it was just an individual. Okay, that's great. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. We'll move on to Damon from Woolwich Observer. Go ahead, Damon. Hello. Uh, to start off, I have a question for uh, Chair Karen Redmond. Um, with the announcement uh, this week of the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Committee, you guys had your first meeting. Can you tell us some of the things that were discussed and what we're expecting to come out of these meetings? Uh, thanks for uh, the question, Damon. It is a... Um, uh, Council-led COVID economic recovery team that is hoping that it will look at the instruments and the tools that are available to the region. Um, for instance, um, planning um, approvals and things like that, as well as um, how we uh, apply development charges as we come out of this um, COVID pandemic uh, downturn in the economy, if there's things that we can do that will um, enhance the ability of um, the biz business community and corporate Waterloo region to invest in the region and take away any barriers that might exist. So there is a fairly focused strategic um, look at what we can do as a region. There is another meeting next week and it, the hope is that whatever findings or decisions that this uh, COVID um, economic recovery team looks at will be fed um, into council and council will look at that as it goes forward um, for budget uh, 2021. Okay, great. And then my next question here, just one second. Um, so this is for Dr. Emily. With the announcement of public health um, partnering for this new provincial app in Ontario being the subjects, what type of numbers should we expect from the launch of this app? And I guess, how do you guys see this playing out? Well, I think it's early days to be able to answer that question. From what I understand, the app will be voluntary. So I think it's going to depend on the uptake from the public. We're hoping that it'll help people. Um, it'll help us identify people who might have been in contact with someone with COVID that we could follow up. So I think, um, if I recall, I've seen some information from out west, and it, it was in the range of 10 to 20 percent of uh, people picked up on it. So I think it really is going to depend on how many people voluntarily sign up for the app. Okay, and then um, on the dashboard, there was a retail outbreak. Can you provide us any details on that? Um, I don't have information about that right now. Um, in terms of our outbreaks um, that we put up, in general, it's the risk, if we felt there was a risk to the community, we would be communicating in more detail. When we're posting for the dashboard, it's really more of an awareness to understand where we're seeing cases, but it's not about a risk to the general community. Okay, and then just one more question. Um, with the loosening of restrictions, cases throughout the region are not consistent comparing like Kitchener to one of the smaller townships. So would it make sense if cases continue to rise in those areas and stay pretty much non-existent in the smaller townships to open at different rates? So I think that's a, a question we've been having at a provincial level, as you've seen, in terms of where does reopening make sense and where do those decisions make sense? Um, in general, you can't assume that cases get their risk from where they live, right? They get their risk from traveling throughout the communities. So I, it, I can't imagine that we'll ever go to a reopening strategy that goes below the regional level because of the fact you can't confidently tag exposure risk to where you live. Okay, great. That's all my questions for today. Thank you. Thanks, Damon. We'll now hear from Nicole at CTV. Go ahead, Nicole. 
Hi, this is a question for Dr. Emily, and I guess it's, um, you know, following up on Damon's question. Um, Waterloo Region is a tech hub, and we're here, you know, we've heard that the two companies involved in the app are Shopify and BlackBerry. Um, has the app been tested here already in conjunction with public health? And perhaps um, are you requesting residents, you know, to perhaps get the app considering it's a local tech hub and two companies involved are from Waterloo Region? So Nicole, this is a provincial initiative. Um, so it's really been led by the province. Um, health units haven't been, uh, we haven't been involved in the pilot testing and it's really early days. We're also excited to hear more information about it to understand how it works and how we can better promote it. Um, it was just launched, and so um, we are excited about it, but we need more information, but we'll be planning to promote it. This morning, we noticed uh, noticed on the dashboard that um, there were more than 2,000 tests added in the past 24 hours, which seems like a larger number. Um, any idea why of the increase in tests over the past 24 hours? There is uh, There could be two uh, potential um, reasons. Um, we get our tests reported to us from the hospitals and um, on the testing sites, not just the hospitals, I should say. And sometimes it doesn't get reported every day. So sometimes a bump is a delay in reporting. I'm also aware that um, Grand River has been doing a drive-through testing model. And that in and of itself has been um, able to see many more people in one day. So that may also be contributing to the bump in tests. Thank you. Um, so looking at the numbers across Canada, Alberta, they're starting to see um, an increase again in numbers and locations where um, they reopened, you know, so their province has reopened before us. And in the United States, we're starting to see a uh, bump up the numbers again in cities that reopened prior to us. Are you expecting the same sort of um, increase going forward? And are you concerned um, that we may be heading down that road. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, I think that's why we're stressing it's important to be vigilant. If we continue to practice social dis physical distancing, you know, staying at home when you're sick, washing your hands and wearing masks when you can't, we're hoping that we can manage the reopening. If we start to see a jump in numbers, then we have to reassess what that, how are people, what is people's behavior that may be contributing to that? With that said, even when people are following measures, the closer you are, especially in workplaces, the more risk there is for outbreaks. So right now we're monitoring that, but we haven't um, had any indicator that that's happening. Final question, I guess it has to do with the um, Forest Heights. How are things going over there um, it's still declared an outbreak, uh, you know, will St. Mary's sort of stop managing it soon when, it, yeah, can you give us an update what's going on? So St. Mary's is managing Forest Heights and has a, a daily presence there, and we obviously are involved. The outbreak won't be declared over, and this is for all outbreaks until you've had 14 days past the last case because you're, you want to be sure that there are no other cases incubating that might come up. And so you can see with the numbers of forest heights, they're much drastically reduced. Um, so it's really, we have to wait until we see that 14 day clear period. And St. Mary's and public health is still working very closely with forest heights um, to ensure that we're managing IPAC and supporting them as we try and get them out of this outbreak. And final question, the last, the current, the new um, outbreaks, is everyone at those homes, are they being tested as a result of the outbreaks? So uh, when we have outbreaks, we do a risk assessment of who needs to be testing, tested. Sometimes it is a focus testing and sometimes it is the, the whole home, depending on the situation. And so we're still in the process of determining that testing strategy. So it does look different depending on what the case looks like, what the issue, the, what the home uh, IPAC measures look like, and what might be some possibilities of where we think the infection came from or started. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so with that, we've gone through the first round. So I'm just going to see a show of hands if there's any other questions. Oh, Kate, go ahead, Kate. <laughs> Thank you. I moved inside because it was getting way too hot outside. Um, uh, Dr. I was going to say Dr. Julie, Dr. Emily. Um, either way, it works. Eh? Um, first of all, before I ask this, can you just confirm your, your full title for us? Um, I'm the Acting Associate Medical Officer of Health. Okay, fabulous. Um, with the two outbreaks that we saw, um, the one at Sunnyside and the one at Parkview Mennonite, Park, yeah. Um, do we have a sense yet of how those uh, residents became infected? Like, is it from other residents who maybe are still battling the, yeah. uh, the infection? So I think it's too early to, to determine that. Um, when we get the first case, part of our investigation or assessment is to try and identify that. And it takes time because you have to get the results of testing, you have to do a little bit of investigative work. Um, so I think right now it's too early to be able to say anything. And I don't know your, your history in public health, how long you've been yeah. doing that part. But when you look at something like Forest Heights, they've been in outbreak since April 1st. That's two and a half months for an outbreak. And to me, as a layperson outside, it seems like a very long time. Is that an unusual amount of time for an outbreak? Like in, in say, you know, a flu season, maybe the outbreak goes all winter or something like that. So um, to answer your first question, I've been in public health Oh, um, I'll tell my age by this, but since 2005, so 15 years about. Um, so we have to remember that COVID-19 is much different than let's say the flu. The flu, we have a vaccine and we have a treatment. So COVID-19, we, we don't have either. So we don't have a way to stop transmission easily by either treating the person or vaccinating someone who may be at risk. And we also know that it is easy to spread. And so I think that's why outbreaks look different in COVID-19 times than they, let's say, would look like with flu. And I think we've also learned, and as I think Mike mentioned uh, previously, guidelines and what we know about COVID have constantly evolved. And one of the things about early outbreaks that happened, they happened before universal masking. So at the beginning, we weren't always masking as a healthcare provider when we were interacting with residents. And we also weren't testing as much as we do now. So the masking allows you to stop uh, transmission. From, so it allows you to prevent the outbreak from happening. And testing allows you to more quickly get an outbreak under control. So some of why some outbreaks are longer than others is they were early on when we were still um, learning how to uh, manage COVID. So it is different than flu because we don't have the treatment and we don't have the vaccine. And maybe just one last question, either for you, Dr. Emily, maybe Mike, if you wanted to jump in. Uh, last weekend, we saw some pretty wild photos of groups getting to patios and enjoying the sun. With it gonna be extra hot this weekend, maybe people wanna take dad to a patio. Um, you know, were you guys happy with what happened last weekend? Was it okay? Was there, I, I know we talked about enforcement and, and that sort of thing, but how, how were patios last weekend and should people be doing anything different this weekend? Um, so I'll just say a couple of things. You know, I think, Kate, it's variable. It's variable. We, we've seen uh, photos, anecdotes of some areas, some patios where, you know, appropriate physical distancing, um, you know, everybody following the guidelines. And then, you know, we've seen other photos where obviously people weren't. Um, so, you know, those are some of the complaints that our enforcement staff would have responded to. Um, you know, and as you know, their typical, you know, first response is education, warning. Um, and, you know, what we're typically seeing is if we need to respond uh, and remind people about the guidelines that they're supposed to be following, um, they do. Uh, right. And it's, you know, that's, we're not seeing um, repeated um, sort of flaunting of the guidelines. And, and that's where, you know, the monitoring and enforcement would lead to charges. Um, and, you know, as, as we've seen, um, if we need to, we'll lay charges. Um, overall, 
we're seeing relatively good compliance. Uh, and I think, you know, credit to, um, credit to restaurants and bars that they have gone out of their way to understand what the guidelines are and try to make sure that they're following um, the guidelines. I don't know, Julie, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I would say like we, the advice we've been saying is consistent. We want people to enjoy Father's Day and be with family and take advantage of reopening of patios, but we want to be doing it safely, both on the part of the businesses and the customers who are going. And that's, it's the same mantra. So physically distance, wear a mask when you can't, wash your hands and stay at home if you're sick. And so if people do that, we can continue to be reopened in a safe way. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so last call, any other questions? Okay, Nicole, go ahead. I think this question could either be for uh, Dr. Emily or Mike. Um, since we're in the thick of phase two, phase three is in the horizon. What would hold you back from entering phase two, phase three? Like, what would you recommend to the residents to say, hey, if you don't do this, then we won't enter phase three, just to make sure that they're compliant. If there's anything, pieces of advice or anything like that. Well, um, so Nicole, I'll make a, a couple of general comments and then um, Dr. Emily may want to add more detail. The general comment is we continue to follow the guidance and direction from the province, right? And so it's the province that opened the door to stage two, phase two, um, and the province has some very high level guidelines about when they would move to phase three and what phase three would look like. So we will absolutely um, follow the lead of the province. And, and in a number of cases, um, that moving from phase two to phase three will require the province to rescind or amend emergency orders, right? That are restricting certain things that can and can't happen. For instance, um, our libraries and museums and what services they can provide, they're currently limited by some of these emergency orders. So, um, you know, that's I think been a consistent message for a number of months is um, we'll take our guidance from the province on moving from stage two to stage three uh, I, and I don't know if um, Dr. Emily wants to add, you know, what criteria the province might look at. I, I agree with Mike. It, it really is a provincial uh, decision and criteria setting. Um, I think probably the most obvious would be a spike in cases or concerns that we're seeing transmission occurring. And that's why the message, again, is the, the community plays a role in that the more that businesses are making the reopening safe and the more that our community is following public health advice when they're out and about, the more likely we are to remain low in terms of cases. The more people don't do that, the more likely we are to see cases increase. And that at the end of the day is one of the key factors that determines, do you go to that next stage? Okay, so are there any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, seeing no hands, I think we can con conclude today's uh, media briefing. Thank you to everyone for participating and I hope you all have a safe weekend. We'll see you back here on Tuesday for our next media briefing. Take care. Happy Father's Day.